So good morning, everybody. Uh, very warm well welcome here at the University of Louvain. Um, my name is Kevin Guillaume. I'm the Secretary General of Circle U. Um, and I must admit that I'm very, very pleased and very honored, in fact, to be here with you all. Um, I'm very happy to see uh, many faces uh, that I know, other faces that I don't know, and that's really good also. Um, today, um, first thing that I would like maybe to underline is, of course, to thank um, the University of Louvain to, for hosting and organizing this really important event, not only for Circulu, but I guess for all the communities of our nine university and beyond. Uh, I think, and we will see today with uh, this ceremony for the first um, inter Circulu Prize, that interdisciplinarity uh, and transdisciplinarity is just key to the future of what we are doing. And we will see with the project that have been awarded, awarded, awarded uh, what have been concretely um, the meaning of uh, transdisciplinarity or interdisciplinarity. Um, I would like specifically to thank um, the team uh, from the administration of research at, at Louvain. Um, they have been working hard to organize and put up uh, this, uh, this event uh, that is not just about, as you know, the ceremony today, but you had also workshop this morning, uh, another um, in opening of the conference yesterday. There have been, as you know, also some sand pits. So some uh, uh, researchers have been locked down in a, in a hotel to work together, to work on new ideas, to exchange uh, with the help of our co some colleagues here. Um, so this morning uh, will be about uh, really hearing uh, what have been the outcomes of the first uh, ICUP, as we say, the inter Prize, and to, at the end of the day, just showcase uh, what is interdisciplinarity, in interdisciplinarity or transdisciplinarity. But before that, I would like just to uh, say a few words about CircleU. Uh, back in 2018-2019, uh, the rectors and president meet together and it was clear from their side that they wanted just to make something happen. Of course, we know the Bologna process for more than 20 years. Our universities have been working together on the bilateral uh, dimension, have been working together on project, on research project together, on mobility, etc. Et but I think with the European University Initiative and also uh, the fact that it's opening new forms of uh, cooperation between universities, we are at the momentum for university uh, higher education and research in Europe and uh, worldwide, I guess. Um, I've been working for more than 14 months now as Secretary General of CircuU, and I can tell you how crazy and how big uh, this process has been. We are not just talking about researchers working together, we are not talking about just having students coming from one university down to another. It's really about transforming what we are as university, what we are as academics, as researchers, as administrative staff. And I think I must admit that and explain to you that before uh, in my past, I've been working on the Bologna process for the ministry here for education and research. And in my opinion, uh, the European University Initiative is a new Bologna process. 20 or 25 years ago, uh, the Bologna process arrived, changed radically the structure and the way that we are co collaborating in Europe at the systemic level. Now with the European University Initiative, it's really about how we want to work together and how university can seize the opportunity to change uh, the cooperation, the way that we are doing higher education and, and research. And therefore, um, I'm really pleased to have so many people and have also the occasion to discuss about that with you. So as I told you, and as you probably know, uh, CircuitU is of course uh, having a lot of different activities in research and innovation. I mentioned just uh, before that uh, some early career researchers have been uh, locked down in a hotel to work on what uh, their ideas, their project uh, through sand pits. Uh, I've heard that uh, it has been, it's already the second session that the really nice ideas are there and I'm sure that it's the way also that we have to think about transdisciplinarity and in interdisciplinarity. You know also uh, maybe that uh, within Circle U we have uh, started to establish uh, what we have called um, interdisciplinary uh, research network, the ITRN, where basically we put together researchers to work on um, interdisciplinary uh, aspects, subject together, and make sure that they can work concretely and collaborate on concrete activities and events and other uh, projects. And last but not least, uh, and that's why we are here today, uh, we have launched uh, in the spring uh, this year the first call for uh, the inter Circle U Prize, where basically the idea is not just to push interdisciplinarity, but it also to showcase what has been done so far. 
As you might know, and I will not go in too much into details, but CircleU is based, and the ecosystem of CircleU is based mainly on three knowledge hubs, which are climate, about climate, global health, um, and democracy. And basically, by establishing the knowledge hub, we want also to push the academic community, the research community, to work together on this kind of project. And with this first prize here, the idea was really to uh, demonstrate that, of course, we have already a lot of things happening in terms of interdisciplinarity, but we want also those projects that have been awarded to maybe um, be a kind of model or maybe push new ideas within uh, our communities. To give you a short information, we have received uh, 90 uh, applications for this prize. There have been a jury, uh, jury that have been uh, evaluating and selecting also the project. Um, this jury was made of um, uh, senior researcher, uh, some pro-rectors, director for international uh, for uh, research, um, and after the selection, three projects have been selected, and I'm very pleased that today we have at least a representative from two projects, and online we have our colleagues also from Humboldt that will also present the project here. Um, I will not go too much into details. I will directly pass the floor to uh, our colleagues uh, that have been here and awarded with this prize. Um, so the idea now is that we will have 12 minutes per project. And what I would like maybe to ask you uh, is really to focus your presentation on how your project is contributing to interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity. Uh, see how you have undertaken that uh, concretely, because I know that it's easy in a way to really push interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity, but basically how does that happen in a project? How do we work with other colleagues from different disciplines, from different faculties, with maybe a different kind of uh, academic and scientific culture? How do we do that? Um, and last also, uh, what another point that I would like maybe that you could underline is really about the role that your institution have played and how you have been maybe helped and supported by your institution in this kind of project uh, to really uh, push interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity. So we will start first from a colleague from uh, the University of Oslo. Um, so uh, Manon Bajar, as the name is saying, is not Norwegian, but she's French, but working at the University of Oslo. Um, you have uh, made your, uh, most of the education research in, in, in France, not at the University Paris Cité. Nobody is perfect, but still it's really good. Um, but um, so together uh, with uh, our colleagues, uh, Ingar Gunnarsson, uh, you have been working together on a project that's called Viking. We are in Norway, of course. Um, but it's really interesting. I must admit that when I was a kid, I had a fascination for volcanoes. I've never been to a volcano, but I was really fascinated to see this project. But anyway, through your project, but you will explain more about that, you have tried to see how we can analyze, um, combine, the, the, the effect of uh, uh, paleoclimate and paleoenvironmental reconstruction with also the effect on climate. And I think that it's really relevant also for what we are doing and especially in the knowledge. I will pass you the floor directly, uh, so 12 minutes if you may, and please. Uh, thank you, and uh, thank you to the Circle U for the invitation. It's, we are very pleased and honored to receive uh, this prize today and to present our Vikings project uh, together with uh, Inga. So Viking stands for volcanic eruption and the impact on climate, environment, and Viking society in the period from the 6th century to the 13th century, so the common era. Um, so this is a big project, including uh, like 20 researcher, PhD, postdoc, researcher, and professor. Um, so some facts about the project to present it very practical detail, so it was funding by the Norwegian Research Council. Uh, it started in 2018 and it's, lasted, it's lasting for five years with 2.5 million euro. We have our project manager, which is the leader of uh, the application for the Norwegian Research Council, Kirsten Kruger, who is, who is, she is a meteorologist at the University of Oslo. Um, so we have uh, several PIs uh, leading the different work package of this project. I will detail that later. We have um, uh, several postdocs and PhD students working, hired among us, uh, so me and Inga were in that uh, project, and collaborators from uh, Germany, Switzerland, for example, uh, Iceland. And to answer one of the questions about the, the institution and their role in the transdisciplinarity, it was actually uh, a requirement for, for the call to build a pluridisciplinary uh, team and to include different disciplines in that project, in one project. 
So a little bit of background about that project. So if we look here at the climate, climate variation um, through the last 2,000 years, um, so we have the ages here, and the present is on the, the right. Uh, we have a clear link between the, the temperature and uh, the um, occurrence of uh, volcanic eruption. So volcanic eruption have a role in the, the changes in the temperature uh, on the Earth. And we are specifically interested in a couple of volcanic eruption from unknown volcano in 536, 540 that are highlighted here. And this has triggered a big cooling in the North Hemisphere specifically. And uh, it's associated in archaeological record to migration, abandonment of settlement. And the idea is to understand more uh, the effects of uh, this volcanic eruption on the climate and then the impact on the environment and society. So, and then coming to the Viking Age, how this history has affected the Viking and how they responded to the volcanic eruption. Um, so the project was divided in uh, four work package. Uh, first work package on about the Scandinavian archives with here different archives to measure the climates and the human activities. So it's including uh, lake sediment, it's including tree rings analysis, ice core, and also biogeochemistry marker. And uh, then later we also had a biologist on board with DNA analysis, for example. So this is just one work package and it's already several disciplines inside. A package about volcanic eruption with uh, also mixing ice core and modeling from uh, a different volcano from Iceland, for example. A work package about modeling of the climate and then a package about archaeology and uh, society. Um, so this is in short. So. Uh, the idea is to obtain a holistic view of uh, volcanic eruption on climate, environment and society, try to answer a common question by integrating complementary data set. And some challenges is to uh, connect uh, the different discipline but also the different scales because we have a volcanic eruption in Iceland that is emitting particles, sulfur, and this sulfur is cooling the climate at some point for some volcanic eruption. And this is recorded in the ice core, so we, can, we have this history in the ice core by studying the ice core. And then the cooling of the climate is affecting the society. And we can measure that in different sites, in a different scale, in archaeology and natural environment, natural archives. And then we can also model at different scale uh, the climate and uh, the impact on the environment. Um, so how do we approach the interdisciplinarity? Uh, so first is to get to know the language and science of the others. For example, in the first uh, annual meeting or first meeting we had together, it was uh, the definition of the word artifact which is not the same in uh, natural science and archaeology. So for us working on climate, we don't want to have any artifact in our data set. But archaeologists are looking for artifacts because it's the archaeological material. So we had to, to agree what is artifact or not. So we had to, to understand the language of the others. And this is uh, by exchanging a lot. So we have also supervision of PhD across the different work package discipline together to improve and increase these exchanges. We need to exchange our data so we can compare. So we need to trust each other on the data we are sharing. And write, of course, paper together by combining the, the data set. And this is quite a challenge. And put for that, we had, for example, weekly meetings, informal weekly meetings with the young researcher, PhD and postdoc. Um, to exchange on a regular basis. So every week, uh, one person was presenting his research and we had like some sweets, some drinks, <coughs> explaining, taking the time to really understand what the others are doing and try to figure out and ask questions and improve the, the answers. Uh, excursion on the world group with lots of fiction on the terminology again, explaining the details. So we bring, for example, the world group on the fieldwork, so either uh, lake coring, either uh, archaeological excavation, museums, and of course meetings. Uh, so we are now going to present you two concrete examples of research we have done uh, in that project. 
So first example focus on uh, the one idea, one possibility to work pluridisciplinary is to work on one specific site. So we find a, a site that was, uh, we could integrate all the different approaches. So we work on a site that is called Ragnarhagen. So Ragnarhagen is this uh, high hill in the background um, of this picture, uh, close to this lake. And this is uh, made by human, it built by human, so it's a burial mound built in the mid 6th century, so just after this uh, 536, 540 uh, volcanic event that cooled the climate. And this is made uh, with trees. So we have an archaeological site and also several farmsteads from a different period around uh, uh, as well. And so um, this mound is made of trees, so we have the, the capacity to analyze the tree and work on the tree rings uh, data for climate reconstruction. And also we have the chance to have this lake just on the shore, on the side, and here we have also natural archives, lake sediments, where we can reconstruct the, the temperature and human activities. And we also have different scale of analysis here in time, I mean, uh, the archaeology has uh, different artifacts that are not continuous in time, it's period of settlements, period with no settlements, and and uh, different artifacts that are not continuous in time. But on the lake sediment, we have a continuous archive through time of uh, climate, for example, and human activities. And the tree rings is also continuous, but it's limited to the life of the trees and the period the, the month was built. Um, so for example, we have uh, here different study where we have mixed geology, biology, and archeology span for the study of lake sediment and show that it was um, um, uh, change in the agricultural practices linked to the change in the temperature. And uh, we were able also to link the period of settlements from the archaeology with what we find in the lake sediments in terms of human activities and agriculture. And I will just, um, Inga will just continue with the second example. Thank you. In this second example, it's, uh, it's um, from an uh, article we're writing on right now, which will be published in Climate of the Past in 2023. In this uh, uh, study, we tried a somewhat different approach, much of the same data and, uh, and uh, methods, but a somewhat different approach when it comes to inter-site comparison. You know, comparison different kind of landscapes within southern Norway to see whether the climate change would affect these landscapes in similar or different ways. So by combining earth system models, which is climate simulations with local requirements for grain cultivation, vegetation records and archaeology, it's possible to get a better picture of the relationship between climate change and human change. Because we need to keep in mind that Vikings or proto-Viking societies were also farming societies and they were deep, uh, heavily dependent on farming production. So when working on, uh, on uh, this data, there's primarily ice core deposits, which is very important because uh, they contain a lot of information on the climate of the past, which then can be used as input values in these climate models, and then compared to triggering temperature reconstructions and also the archaeological evidence. But the key here is actually how to bridge between the disciplines, which is, goes to the heart at interdisciplinarity. Because how do we substantiate that there is a link between climate change and human change in the past? So in our approach, we have used the uh, term vulnerability as an analytical tool to approach this question. Because if you are able to substantiate that working societies were vulnerable to climate change, it's also easier to uh, point out the causal relationship between the two. So, so, uh, just like Mano was uh, talking about, uh, and in short, the volcanic eruptions, they have, they are out of time already. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay, volcanic eruptions, they affect the climate, you know, by bursting sulfur into the stratosphere, and which then affects the climate on the surface, either by climate cooling or, in some instances, even climate warming. And this data can be used as input values in the climate models where you can study how the climate develops uh, at different spatial and temporal scales. 
For instance, we see that the average temperature reduction for uh, 530 to 550 is about one degree Celsius below the modern average, where in certain years, like 537 and 541, it becomes a lot more colder, which of course then would affect food production. We also see from the tree ring temperature re reconstructions that the temperatures might have dropped between minus two and minus three degrees below the modern average. And we combine this data then with the modern weather data from, uh, from chosen landscapes, which are here in uh, the mountainous inlands of eastern Norway, the southwest coast of uh, Norway, and also the southeast inlands of Norway. And we chose these three different areas because they had different climate, they are associated with different weather uh, systems. Like in the mountainous inlands, it's quite cold and dry, but nonetheless an important agricultural region. In the southwest, it's warm and wet, and it's dry and warm in southeast. And all these factors heavily um, condition the agricultural practices in these areas. And when we combine them and this data from the models and see what happens to the agricultural landscape if the temperature drops by, for instance, minus three degrees, we see different regional patterns emerging. And that some areas, like the mountainous inlands and southwest coast, are very much vulnerable to a cooling, that agriculture is likely to fail in these areas during a severe cooling event. Whereas in southeastern Norway, they actually have good temperature margins, and it's not, it seems like uh, climate cooling will not affect agriculture that heavily as in other parts of southern Norway. And then we combine these results with the vegetation data, the pollen records from this area, and archaeological data, and we see a similar patterns, that some areas seem to be heavily vulnerable to climate change, whereas others were not. And this provides a whole new picture of the dynamics between climate change and human change in Scandinavian prehistory. Thank you, Inga. So that was uh, it, and we will be happy to take some questions later to meet. And thanks for listening, and uh, thanks to all our collaborators uh, in that project. Thank you very much, Manon and Inga. Um, I think that unfortunately we won't have the time now to take questions, and I'm sure that during the, the lunch we could, uh, 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 we could maybe continue. Um, so if you agree, we will pass virtually from Oslo to uh, Berlin, uh, where our colleague, the professor uh, Robert Allinghaus, uh, was not able, unfortunately, to join us physically, but is here online. Um, professor Allinghaus is a professor at the Humboldt University to Berlin, but also at the Leibniz Institute. And basically, the project that he has been working on uh, is working on sustainable fisheries. And I think that you have tried to study also uh, human interaction with environment and also ask some uh, economic and socioeconomic uh, question and ecological question and how we can uh, maybe proceed and, and really find some uh, sustainable solution for inland and coastal fisheries. So I propose that uh, I give you directly the floor and, and thank you for joining uh, even virtually. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. I can't see the audience, so I'm just Yes, talking. we can hear you. And do you see my presentation slides now? I think you do. Good. Okay, I'm not going to see you. Uh, if anything happens, just have to talk into the microphone. So I'm not um, starting the presentation now. First of all, thank you very much for, for the award and for the invitation. I'm super sorry to not being there in, in person, but I have ill kids and I really need to care about them. So sorry. And um, I'm presenting here my project, which is towards sustainable fisheries. But I'm not doing this alone. So this uh, work um, that I'm doing here is really the collective effort of a super group of collaborators, students, um, postdocs, technicians, etc. over now 13 years of work that we are um, doing inter and inter and transdisciplinary work, dealing with um, solutions for sustainable fisheries. And this group joins um, psychologists, fisheries ecologists, evolutionary biologists, economists, um, governance and political ecologists. So it's really interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary by design. And what unites us is that we ask questions where we, at in a way where we need at least two disciplines 
to answer them. And I will give you a few examples um, of our research that um, use that approach in, in a minute. So what's the context for all of this? We live in the Anthropocene and we have a um, substantial biodiversity crisis and freshwater biodiversity is in particularly strong decline. So Tigna and others here actually outline that rapid decline of biodiversity and fish is among them, but also they highlight solutions how we can bend the curve to improve the situation. And if you look on the right, there are a few examples of actions that we can take and a few of them actually deal with uh, sustainability in capture fisheries, which means the use of wild living fishes. And this is where we are contributing with our lab. Our mission is to provide the scientific foundation to improve fisheries and um, to make it more sustainable where it is unsustainable right now. We mainly work with inland systems, so rivers and lakes, and this means we are mainly dealing with recreational fisheries, so the sport aspects of, of fishing, because in all industrialized countries, this is the major form of use of wild living fishes. We have 220 million people globally that fish for recreation, in Europe among about 10% of the population that engages, and most systems are actually not only used, but also managed by recreational fishing clubs. And that's the context where we work. So if we want to produce solutions for sustainability in fisheries, we can attack that from an academic perspective, right? This is a, a view of a mental model, how a scientist like myself might perceive uh, ecological relationships and perhaps also management solutions to um, address that relationships. Um, however, also people out there, the practical world, um, the stakeholders also have a mental model about how the world functions. And this will structure their behavior. It will also structure how they respond to any management intervention, for example, that an agency suggests to do. So our approach was to work together to co-create solutions for sustainability, to harmonize and co-learn how we, both the scientists, but also the practitioners, think together and um, about solutions, about effects of fishing, about new ways of management. And we did this through joint experiments where we involved um, the angling clubs, the anglers, in jointly experimenting with management interventions at the rivers and lakes, particularly, that are managed by these fishing clubs. So that was our approach. And I will give you one example in more detail and touch on a second very roughly uh, how we did this. So the first example is, is the controversial practice of fish stocking, which is a dominant management intervention in inland fisheries globally. Basically, since 100 years, people invented a way of artificially inseminating fishes. And this has become like the approach where people say, OK, if the fish stocks decline, why don't we just put new fish in that are produced in hatcheries, for example, in aquaculture, or captured elsewhere and transported into a certain ecosystem? It's a widespread activity. Millions of fish are released every year to support fisheries. Ecologists in the 90s became concerned, um, and particularly conservationists, because introducing new fish could create hybridization between different populations of native fishes. It could introduce new diseases, and you could inadvertently also spread invasive species. So there was a big debate whether this activity is sustainable or not. And within the fishery sector, there is a big debate whether actually it fulfills the aspirations, whether we can actually increase uh, reproducing natural population of animals, in this case fish, by adding new animals on top of it. And um, as an ecologist and population dynamics person, one would often question whether such um, activities actually have the intended effect. However, if you tell this to a, an Anglo community, they would all um, very often say, well, I don't believe you. So we said, okay, let's join forces and let's do joint experiments where we mark fish, release them, and evaluate over a period of six years whether the stocks have increased or not. So we did an ecological experiment with model species, carp and pike. That's not very relevant here in that audience, but different species in 24 lakes managed by recreational fishing clubs. So we used their systems, we recruited angling clubs, and then transdisciplinarily planned and executed those um, stocking experiments with different treatments. However, we wanted to also measure whether transdisciplinarity has intended effects in the co-learning environment. So we embedded 
a social experiment on top by differentiating how we as a scientific group interacted with the different practitioners. So we had five clubs where we had a transdisciplinary interaction, but also passive consumption of knowledge where we actually gave lectures on sustainable fish stocking. We had a second treatment where we only gave passive um, consumption of knowledge through seminars. And then another treatment, the placebo treatment, where we also gave seminars where we didn't talk about stocking. And then we did a before after control impact design or difference and difference design, socially measuring what changed in the anglers and the managers perceptions, knowledge, etc., due to our intervention. So we really wanted to also measure how well transdisciplinarity works in addition to measuring the ecological outcomes of fish stocking experiments. So this is how the transdisciplinary interaction worked. So we did first a four and a half um, hour seminar on sustainable stocking and then engaged in a series of workshops where we planned this actual stocking experiments. We derived hypotheses together. We examined where to stock, how many fish, et cetera, et cetera. Then the anglers were involved uh, in the actual assessments of the fish ecological outcomes. They took part uh, in our fishing, but they also had diaries. Uh, more than 5,000 people actually reported their catches, and this was also used to measure the success, biologically speaking, of that fish stocking. And they also had to do lots of social uh, surveys, and sometimes we used a few drugs, weak drugs, to actually incentivize uh, all those answering. So we, of course, also measured how people's perceptions, beliefs, etc., changed over time. Now, um, one result just from the ecological aspect, here you see um, three treatments, control lakes, um, um, intermediate stocking density and the high stocking density, in this case, pike stockings, and the bars indicate the size of the stocks before we actually did the stocking intervention. And then we can measure whether the population size is actually increased. And, and to cut the long story short, in this particular case, this was done in 19 lakes in, in Lower Saxony in northwestern Germany, we don't see any change in the abundance. So in fact, the abundance was the same of fish, despite actually adding more than 1,000% increase in the young um, fish size classes into the system. What you see is that half of the stock in those uh, stocking treatments now is composed of introduced fish. So you didn't elevate the stock size, but you replaced wild uh, recruits, and this is ecologically harmful and economically wasteful. We could also find in other examples where stocking worked, and these were particularly the cases where you worked with non-naturally recruiting fishes, so we could actually find situations where it does work and where it does not work. That's from the ecological side, and that now the question, did these nuances actually also affect how people think about this? And um, I've shown the results here of the passive consumption of knowledge um, uh, about sustainable stocking and how it affected the knowledge, uh, uh, ecological knowledge of anglers, the beliefs about how management works, the attitudes to management, but also the norms to management. And you can see the more color you see is the more, the stronger the effect was relative to the controls. And you actually see a lot of color, at least for the knowledge, for the beliefs and the attitudes. Immediately after a, a big seminar, people have changed a lot. But 10 months later, lots of this color has gone ag again. There is still a significant difference to the placebo control, but people start to forget about many of these aspects. And importantly, we know from psychology that people particularly respond to norms. These were completely unaffected by just passive consumption of knowledge. By contrast, if we do transdisciplinary interaction, we evolve the anglers in the actual assessments um, of these um, ecology experiments, we not only see that all knowledge, beliefs, and attitudes to names are maintained, but we also see the evolution of a norm that is very critical towards fish stocking and much more open to accepting of alternatives to the stocking, for example, habitat enhancement or harvest regulations something that passive consumption of knowledge does not generate at all. So the question then becomes, and this is the end of the first example, if stocking doesn't work, what else can we do? So we engaged in a new large scale experiment with dozens of angling clubs, again, hundreds of anglers. It's a project that is almost completed now. We are in the last few months. And what we did now 
is actually improve the ecosystem. So we did shallow water zone creation in uh, artificially created gravel pit lakes. We also implemented dead wood. We manipulated 20 lakes, again, in a huge collaborative effort with these angling clubs, and we compared it again to stocking. So to move from a species-centered conservation measure to one that is centered on the habitats, on the ecosystem, and can also benefit organisms beyond the fish. And to cut a very long story short, we again could not find any effects of stocking. We find only lake-specific effects of dead wood implementation, and we find a very strong effect of shallow water creation, which was lasting in, uh, in terms of increasing the fish abundance and the biodiversity of other organisms. In addition, this project again has fostered a huge transfer and activity by all these participating anglers, large engagement throughout the entire areas where we worked. We had joint learning, a lot of PR activities, and due to that, also many angling clubs across Germany that are not in the project themselves, they have started to introduce habit, uh, habitat enhancement activities beyond what we are doing. So it's really an example where the transfer is very quickly spreading in the communities of practice and can actually change very quickly how people engage and do management of their own systems. So what are the lessons learned um, of these two examples? I could have given you a third one. We are working in coastal fisheries, but I don't have the time for now. So what are the lessons that we get gathered from this inter- and transdisciplinary approaches? The first is that it's very useful to engage in this and it can deal with a real world problems of sustainability. In our case, stocking, habitat enhancement, but also harvest management in general. It works, it can help to design solutions to reduce uncertainty about how management works by doing realistic experiments at the scale of whole ecosystems. But at the same time, such research can also be conducted at a very high academic level. I mean, we have replicated experiments, it's very rarely done in, in the environmental sciences, and we have embedded ecosystem experiments with social experiments, which, which is also academically quite novel, we think. To do that, one needs lots of things. We need supporting organizations and structures. We need the funding. And, and we were very lucky to have long-term funding, typically five or six years project durations, mainly funded by the German Ministry of Education and Research. And I'm extremely grateful for this long-term funding because many of these projects simply take time to set up and to measure also these ecological responses. And I'm also very grateful for my home institution, the Humboldt University of Berlin, through the think tank, the Integrated Research Institute of Transformations of Human Environment Systems, but also the Leibniz Institute of Freshwater Ecology and Indian Fisheries, who really support inter- and transdisciplinary work. And, you know, you couldn't put me in any domain. I'm doing social science, I'm doing ecological science, and that's appreciated, um, even if we don't go into depth in any of those single disciplines. I think this, this melting of disciplines is something that the think tanks really support. Challenges remain. We still are in a disciplinary academic system and many faculties are organized like that and not everybody likes the way we do this type of science. Second point is the three year PhD cycles that we have in Germany are I think too short to be embedded in such inter- and transdisciplinary projects because lots of time goes into communication, into learning the language of the other discipline, and so on. We also need substantial resources, time, money, and a very skilled team that is willing and able to engage with society and to do a process that is at an equal eye level with stakeholders and keeps them engaged over a six-year time period. And this is something that is rare and needs also money and skills, and this is not always there. So with that, again, Circle U, thank you very much for, for this award. Um, it's, it's motivating to get recognition, but I really also want to thank the funders of all this work and the, in fact, thousands of people and agencies, NGOs, clubs, landowners, and the colleagues for 13 years of work. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Robert. I'm not sure you heard, but people were clapping for you, so, so just for you to know. Uh, so, but thanks very much for the very inspiring uh, presentation, and I think that 
two things maybe that I would like to underline is first how you explain the impact also on the community of practice, which is really interesting also where you are working on, on fundamental research projects like this. And also I think that you had really good lesson learned and maybe some messages that we could take also for the future of CircuitU. As you might know, we are working on the next phase of CircuitU and I think that there, of course, um, we are trying and helped by the academic chairs, the researchers, the academics also to, to know how we will shape the future of CircuitU. But anyway, now we pass from uh, the German lakes um, to uh, the libraries, I would say, or to the history at King's College London. And we are really pleased to have um, uh, Nilo Pedrazzini uh, from King's College London. Unfortunately, Barbara McGillivray uh, was not able to join, but uh, uh, Nilo will uh, present the project that was also awarded in, for this prize. Uh, the project is called Language of Mechanization, and basically you have tried to um, have this intersection between history, computational like linguistic, data science, library science, and see in a way how um, uh, we can use historical digitized records also to analyze the impact that mechanization had on the life of uh, the British people um, with the industrialization of the society. So uh, please, Nilo, the floor is yours. Just gonna quickly test this. Does it work at all? Uh, yeah, okay, perfect. Right, okay. Um, so, hi everyone. So, my name is Nilo Pedrazzini, and as, uh, as he said, I'm one of the researchers in the uh, Language of Mechanization project led by Barbara McGillivray, who couldn't be here. Unfortunately, she had teaching commitments, so very sorry about that. Um, I'm also based at the Alan Turing Institute, which is the uh, UK Institute for, uh, for Data Science and Artificial Intelligence. Um, the, other, the other project members are uh, mainly based at the British Library, except from Professor John Lawrence, who is based uh, at both at the Turing and the University of Exeter. Um, so, the language of mechanization was conceived as uh, an experiment in uh, radically interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary collaboration at the intersection of, uh, between history, computational linguistics, data science, library science, and research software engineer. Uh, it started in uh, 2018, and it's going to end in 2023. Uh, it's part of a, it's a work package, actually, which is part of a, a much larger umbrella project um, called Living with Machines which aims to leverage the uh, potential of historical uh, digitized records um, to, um, to, to kind of analyze the, uh, the, the impact of mechanization on the lives of ordinary people during uh, Britain's rapid transformation, let's say, into an industrial society. In the uh, language of mechanization project specifically, we wanted to answer overarching questions such as, how was the relationship between uh, humans and machines discussed and conceptualized at the time? And how did the um, radical changes in so society relate to uh, linguistic changes? And, and these are actually particularly complex topics to analyze quantitatively. Um, the mechanization of production processes was not a linear phenomenon and historians are not uh, in agreement regarding its pace and its nature. And the material we work on uh, spans more than a century, uh, covering the whole of the 1800s, which means that language changed from the very first to the last uh, sources and variation across registers, social class, geography, in addition to uh, change over time, are complexities that obviously require a deep engagement with historical uh, scholarship. At the same time, uh, the uh, British Newspaper Archive, which uh, is the main corpus we uh, base our research on, hosts almost 53 million pages, and uh, this kind of huge size goes well beyond uh, the scale at which historical research is normally conducted. Uh, and this obviously posed uh, substantial infrastructural and methodological challenges and required advanced computational methods to be fully capitalized on. So our research aims uh, to be not only data-driven approach uh, to history, but also a human-centered 
approach to data science, if that makes sense. So to achieve this, we, um, we built a collaborative uh, research approach that is iterative, self-reflexive, and is designed to evolve, where historical research questions drive the development of computational methods and um, infrastructure. And, but at the same time, we made original contributions to uh, computational science research and engaged the public in the, um, in the research process. Um, Maybe some of you have grasped it already, but the basic approach owes much to the agile uh, project management principle. Um, so we work in sprints, which in our case are spans of two week uh, time where the team works towards a shorter term deadline consisting of an achievable, feasible task. And at the end of each sprint, uh, the team meets and plans for the following sprint, each time incorporating the feedback from the entire team. And this ensures that um, the ideas and perspectives of different researchers from different backgrounds are taken into account at each step of the way, and each team member contributes to the design and delivery of the project um, as a radically interdisciplinary effort. So this way, the project is not designed from start to end, but it constantly evolves and reflects on its own method, uh, changing it slightly or radically depending on the feedback receive, received at every sprint, every two weeks. And um, because of the variety of backgrounds, uh, of the researchers involved, documentation and open practices are crucial to make sure that every member can give uh, feedback and provide original ideas, even if the exact methodology employed across uh, different tasks are maybe out of their comfort zone. Um, we built on um, the previous extensive interdisciplinary experience of the team and often had to overcome sort of assumptions on uh, about how research is done shared or communicated. Uh, for example, multiple authorship in history is actually quite rare, uh, and code and data papers, for example, are still undercredited in academia in general. Um, but in an effort that sort of predated my involvement uh, in the project, different team members implemented uh, an authorship model that would ensure proper credit to all aspects of the research project, and they also created a so-called project charter to facilitate a common understanding of our research practices, address the issues they anticipated may arise, and I think most importantly, they made all efforts uh, not to use discipline-specific jargon, which can be very difficult. And also in line with the open science movement uh, regarding code and data papers, particularly at the intersection of humanities and data science, our research outputs do not only include traditional academic uh, peer-reviewed publications, but also data sets, data papers, code, and also actually blog, blog posts and podcasts uh, have helped us reach non-academic um, uh, audiences. I'm just going to briefly now show you a couple of examples um, of kind of sub-project within Living with Machine. Um, so in the Living Machines project, we wanted to understand how technological change was received by ordinary people in the long 19th century. And to narrow this uh, overall question down to a feasible task, we developed a new approach to uh, form formulating historical research questions that could be answered with data science via what the team members called uh, hypothesis generation group sessions, uh, the result of which uh, you can, glim uh, you can uh, glimpse at in this uh, GitHub board. Um, at the end of the process, a more specific question was selected, namely, in, in this case, to what extent were machines seen as autonomous agents? Like thinking, for example, of the sentences like, the steam engine changed the world. Um, the team decided to attempt a training an algorithm that would help automatically detect so-called atypical animacy, for example, the animacy attributed to a machine in historical text. And, um, in this graph, I kind of tried to capture the inter interconnection between the contribution made by different project members. Uh, you don't need to understand every single step of the process, but this is just to give you an idea of how project members uh, with quite different disciplinary expertise contribute to the same research question. So historians, for example, contributed to the interpretation and contextualization of uh, our historical data. Um, and together with our library professionals and digital humanists, they worked on the creation of a new annotated data set uh, containing several examples of atypical animacy. And computational linguists provided the methodological framework, and together with the research software engineers, they made sure that the code associated with the algorithm was uh, developed following best software development practices, sort of. Another example is uh, When Time Makes Sense. Uh, it's another sub-project where the team aimed to answer a question at the intersection of conceptual history, lexicology, and historical uh, information retrieval. Namely, um, how can we automatically associate the most likely meaning 
of polysemous words, meaning words with many senses, for example, machine or engine, with a given historical context of use. So no previous research um, on uh, word senses ambiguation uh, had taken a historical perspective, so we trained an algori a new algorithm for uh, meaning disambiguation on uh, the Oxford English Dictionary, which contains time-stamped quotations for every sense a word has or has had in history. And um, in a similar vein to the previous project, project members from different backgrounds contributed in different ways. So computational linguists contributed to the design of the NLP and information retrieval methodology. Digital humanists worked mainly on selecting relevant senses from the Oxford English Dictionary and merging those um, that were too specific for our pur purposes. Then historians uh, contributed to the annotation of the data and uh, contextualized uh, the historical results. And once again, research software engineers made sure that any computational methods followed uh, best practices in uh, software development. Um, Finally, uh, in the machines in the media, we wanted to explore the question, uh, what did people in the 19th century mean when they read um, you know, words like machine or train or coach or match, railway and traffic? Uh, but we wanted to do so by understanding how practitioners outside of academia can support the development of algorithms to answer this question. Uh, so we asked the public to engage in a large voluntary crowdsourcing annotation exercise and to label text snippets from our data with the most appropriate meaning of the word machine, for example, based on categories, again, derived from the Oxford English Dictionary. And this is actually meant to advance different disciplines simultaneously. Um, we have, on the one hand, the annotated sentences can be used as a source of quantitative analysis, uh, but also as training data to optimize the word senses ambiguation algorithm developed in the previous sub-project, so when time makes sense. Um, on the other hand, it is an extremely useful way as well of understanding how uh, non-academic communities, so-called citizens in citizen science, can be involved in answering large-scale, highly specialized research questions. And finally, it also allows us to uh, develop methods to tackle the significant infrastructural and research software engineering challenges due to the large size of the data sets and the fact that it involves not only experts but also uh, the general population. So I'm almost done. Um, to tackle the letter in particular, uh, software engineers in the team build uh, this, this tool called DFO, um, a toolbox that enables historical research at scale and incorporated the data uh, provided by DFO into other visualizations frameworks, for example, Observable, to facilitate uh, further data exploration for the historians in the team. So kind of this constitutes a bridge between technical knowledge and um, exploratory sort of research for everyone. And then just as a very last thing, I'd like to mention that in addition to uh, the academic papers, code and data sets produced by the project, um, some of the project members actually planned and curated another major output, but this time an exhibition. So talking about non-traditional outputs, uh, which was launched in July 2022. Um, and this is actually critical for the, the project's plan to engage with the public, but I think most crucially and innovatively, it also includes the results of our work uh, with crowdsourcing as a form of public, uh, public engagement. So it includes essentially these results and linguistic work in animated or interactive visualizations highlighting how mechanization changed life in, uh, lives in Britain in the long 19th century with a specific view on workers' lives in Leeds where the the exhibitions took place. And uh, yeah, these are some of the main publication of the Language Mechanization Project. Um, if anyone is interested, I can send you the, the slide and that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nilo. Uh, again, very inspiring. And again, uh, I really like the focus that you give also as Robert on, on the community engagement and how we can also work on citizen science. Uh, honestly, in fact, I'm not a scientist at all, I'm not a researcher, but uh, it's the first time that I heard more about citizen science and an interesting concept also, and, and it could be inspiring for the future. So thanks again. Um, I'm sorry we are a bit late in the schedule. I hope it's okay for the, the, the organizing team at the Louvain, but we will pass now directly. Uh, we wanted to end, the, in fact, the ceremony here with a small panel discussion, and I invite directly our three panelists to join, uh, join me here in front. Uh, we have, uh, so please, 
So we have uh, Samantha Aspinal uh, on my uh, four left. I'm sorry. Uh, Samantha, uh, you are the head of, the, of interdisciplinary research at the University of Leeds. And in fact, in a way, um, I might say you are already a friend of Circuit U because we have used uh, Samantha. She has been the one uh, leading uh, the Sand Pits, the two sessions of the Sand Pit here. And I'm really uh, grateful that you have been able to join us. Um, from what I heard, I've been a very, uh, uh, a very positive experience. Uh, but basically, um, you're the one making inter interdisciplinarity exist at Leeds, I guess. And you are helping also in supporting that it's just not a word that we put on the website of the university, but that it's also something really happening uh, in the university. And, and merci, Jean-Christophe. Um, so we have also uh, Mette Alskov uh, Hansen, uh, who is the Vice Rector for uh, Climate, Environment, and Cross-Disciplinarity at the University of Oslo. Uh, Mette is also involved deeply in Circulu in different work packages, etc. So she's also the one making uh, Circulu uh, alive. Um, and indeed, it's also your role as a Vice Rector to make uh, interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity uh, exist. And last but not least, we have uh, Jean Christophe uh, Renault, uh, the local one. Uh, uh, Jean Christophe is the Director for Research uh, here at the uh, University of Louvain. You are uh, an immunologist uh, by uh, training, um, and you are here also in your capacity of Vice Rector uh, for uh, research, making also sure that we are uh, pushing interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity in research um, here in Nova. So we have approximately a bit less than 30 minutes. I guess that we can maybe do a bit less. Um, but basically, I have only one question, um, and it's really simple. It's you are part of three universities, and basically, what are um, the tools, the mechanism, your instrument, your, your input for making uh, interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity knowledge ecosystem possible at your university? Basically, do you have a magical formula to make uh, transdisciplinary and disciplinary, interdisciplinary exist in your university? So I guess that maybe we can start with uh, Samantha, yeah. if you can give some input. And I will, thank you, Pierre, give you a mic. Is that working? Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so very briefly, thank you for inviting me here today. Um, I'm part of the Horizons Institute at the University of Leeds. Uh, we only officially started in January, but it's something that I've been working on for a long time. So at the University of Leeds, we have uh, seven faculties and we have eight, uh, 11 interdisciplinary centers which cover a center on cancer, fluid dynamics, social scientists, arts and humanities. And all of those centers are supported with internal funding and with colleagues who support academics to apply for grants. And they are in and of themselves interdisciplinary. Well, they're called interdisciplinary, but they are umbrellas of people from different disciplines working together. Uh, I would say multidisciplinary. Um, and there's very little cross-fertilization between them. So uh, we have started this center, Horizon Center Be Institute, because uh, we want to answer the question, when funders come to visit us, which they do, they say things like, we don't want to see what we've already funded. We want to hear from you what the next big ideas are, so that we can take those back, because then they influence the funding rounds in, in the UK and the spending. So Horizons is set up to uh, encourage the very early stage, very blue sky, risky thinking that our academics want to engage in. And um, we have four strands, I'll be very quick. We have a challenge theme, which is thinking about what happens after SD sustainable development goals. We have some challenge themes where ideas emerge and we support them for a year and then we let them fly, hopefully. Um, and then we have a global academy, which I'm part of, which is about developing interdisciplinary um, skills, knowledge, and ways of working. And then we have partnerships. But we're also really lucky to be able to do something different with this. We want to change the pipe work of the support, so it's not just about the academics, it's about I'm in professional services. It's how do we do something different? We're very lucky that our finance director said, when you're putting down your key performance indicators, don't put money. Don't put money generation. 
Don't put numbers of people who engage with you. Think of something different. So we've really been given free reign to think of something really different in this space. And um, so we, we, we we're about tro tracking novel ideas and collaborations, and we use case studies to explore the unexpected outcomes because that's where the gold and the magic happens. And um, we're looking at different ways of working. So we're supported by the Vice-Chancellor and the Deputy Vice-Chancellor for Research and Innovation. And we're growing. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's an exciting bottom-up approach. And, and just very quickly, I don't know how long we've got. Apologies if I've talked too much. I'm also on secondment to our major UK research and innovation funding agency that funds a lot of the research in the UK, and I'm working with them to develop a call for interdisciplinary research. So uh, it's really challenging getting the wording right so that we invite interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary ideas uh, that are not simply, I am a biologist and I, I think I might need to find a social scientist so that I can apply for this call. We're looking for something that we are describing as reciprocity across the disciplines. It's like, how does my discipline um, work with your discipline? And we don't leave this project with our disciplines intact and untouched. How do we, how do we work across the disciplines? So that's, that's where I am. Thank you, Samantha. And maybe now, meta elaborating on what Samantha said, so as you said, Samantha, it's not about just calling an institute interdisciplinary, et cetera. It's about really making it happen. And I wanted to know maybe Meta, from your perspective as director in Oslo, how do you make it happen? Making that media researcher and academics can work together, even if they are coming from different disciplines with maybe different cultures, et cetera. How do you, can you help in, in a way the, the academic and scientific community in Oslo to, to really go into interdisciplinarity and, and transdisciplinarity? I think that most of us are experiencing a sense of urgency when it comes to responding to the really big societal changes that we are facing. And that is a help uh, for those of us who are very concerned with interdisciplinarity because that sense of urgency really requires uh, some kind of action. And I also believe that those of us who are in positions uh, uh, at the level where we, are, where we are able to direct our universities in a certain uh, way, we have a responsibility to respond to the fact that research from our institutions have produced very much of the knowledge about the very uh, crisis that we are in the midst of. Uh, and it would be very strange for me if we produce the knowledge about, for instance, the climate crisis, the crisis of loss of nature, biodiversity, growing inequalities in the world, and then we did not do anything to actually try to respond to that uh, crisis. So I think, uh, what do we do then? I think, there are, I, I think of it as a kind of a scale. You can either be on this side of the scale and you add a few new elements into your university. That's certainly possible to do, and I think nearly all universities are doing something. And that can also be an added value, and it can be fine. But on the other end of the scale, you would actually be looking for really transformative processes that would take this uh, institution or whatever university you're in and really turn it in another direction. That is uh, not easy, and it's uh, hard work, but I, I also think it's fully possible. It just requires, uh, or just is not a good word, it requires uh, efforts, it requires uh, institutional changes. So how do we do that? I think there's not, unfortunately and obviously to everybody, there's not like one answer. But I think you have to do many things at the same time. And I think you really have to think from the top down and the bottom up at the same time. And you have to, th to really take the institutional responsibility for working uh, with each administrative unit, it has to go into every administrative unit to start thinking in that way, and also it has to be made possible. You have to facilitate for researchers. So I, I, I won't give a lot of examples of what we try to do at the University of Oslo, but I mentioned, uh, I'll just mention two things after saying that this, of course, implies not only interdisciplinarity in research, but also in education. And that is often more difficult and more demanding, and we need to put more efforts into that. So just two very brief examples. We have established three uh, cross-faculty um, topics 
where we put in quite a lot of money uh, to facilitate this kind of interdisciplinarity. It's on the topic of one is uh, climate and uh, environment, the other is uh, life science, and the third one is democracy. Uh, they have a lot of uh, activities uh, which help support this. The other thing is we will establish a UIO sustainability hub, which is quite a big effort to, uh, to use the, 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 the topic of sustainability to promote all of these things, uh, to become uh, to also at the same time a more open university, including different forms of knowing, different co forms of co-production of, of knowledge, and finally to be more present and engaged in society. Thank you, Meta. Maybe for, for Jean-Christophe, and again, continuing what you have said, so I think that we agree that it requires time, as you said, it requires money, or at least uh, funding and resources. And therefore, I know that in Louvain, you have established the Louvain 4, in a way which is a, a structure also for doing that, but how do you see, Jean-Christophe, in your capacity also as, as Provector for Research, that we can really think about that in the long term, because we know that we will require time, we will require resources, and how can we, you know, in, again, as, as Provectors and as a Rector also, make sure that in the long run, we will continue that? Yes, first, uh, as a poor rector for research, I think we have some responsibility. You, you said that, that's really important. And I think the first responsibility is to have a clear message to the scientists, to the professor that we recruit in, uh, in our university. And what we do in, in Louvain is every year, at the beginning of the academic year, we uh, meet with all the new professors. And the message I, uh, I'm giving them I'm delivering to them is that what we expect from them is not to publish many papers. It's not to attract a uh, large sum of money to the university because in 100 years from now, nobody will care if the University of Louvain in uh, 2023 has published uh, 3,000 or 4,000 or 10,000 of papers. Nobody will care if the University of Louvain in 2023 will have attracted uh, 200 million of euro or 1 billion of euro. Uh, but what is really important is the impact that the uh, professors, that the scientists at the University of Louvain will have on the, on the future. Of our, of our world. So the, the key message is that uh, each professor, each scientist in Louvain should try to have an impact. There are many ways to have an impact. You can have a theoretical impact in your field. Uh, you can change the landscape of the knowledge in your field and that's perfectly fine. You can have te technological impact and that's perfectly fine also. But if uh, you're working on the large societal challenges that we know, and you mentioned climate, you mentioned global health, uh, specifically for, for Circle U, then uh, a multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, and transdisciplinary approach is, is definitely uh, required. Uh, so that's the reason why people should do that. It's not because the prorector asks to do interdisciplinary research, uh, it, it's because for these challenges, this is really something important. So how can we uh, promote, how can we help the uh, scientists to, to do that? I think there are three levels or three things that, that we should try to do. The first thing is to give examples. Uh, it's good to, to, to have the theory to say, okay, you must do interdisciplinary research, but uh, we have to give an example. We have to put the light on the people that are doing exactly that. And I think what we're doing today, and, and especially by uh, giving these three awards uh, today, is, is really what we need to do to show what the people uh, uh, do when they uh, put that into practice. So giving examples, I think it's the, the first level. But giving example is not enough. Of course, we have to give funding also. And in our university, what we do with the, the, the funding that uh, we control with the, the Research Council of the university, I think about 50% of the funding is dedicated to projects that where the first uh, element of, of selection is the interdisciplinarity of the project. And I was really interested by uh, your project on uh, volcanic eruption because two years ago we had another project that was a little bit related to that where we had uh, one guy working on uh, volcanic eruption, one archaeologist working on the Minoan uh, civilization, 
and another guy, an anthropologist working on uh, Indonesian uh, societies that uh, they work, that are, are living in a context close to volcanoes. And they, 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 together they, they build a very interesting project, and I think they, they should meet you <laughs> <laughs> to, to discuss about the two projects because it's really the, 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 the same idea. So this funding of what we call the concerted actions, I think it, it's really a tool uh, to support this kind, uh, this kind of project. But again, uh, example funding is not enough. We have also to give the opportunities to people to build some, some project. And that's where the Louvain 4 consortia that you mentioned, I think, are useful. The idea of this consortia is to put together people uh, that are coming from the different sectors of the universities, so science and technology, humanity, social science, and uh, health sector, uh, uh, but that are interested in a large field. So we have, the first one was Louvain for nutrition, uh, but we also have Louvain for water, uh, we have Louvain for migration, Louvain for work, Louvain for energy. So people coming from different disciplines uh, that are discussing about opportunities of projects and, and this is where uh, new projects can, can, can start. And another example, of course, are the sand pits uh, that uh, uh, with Circle U have been organized and, and I think yesterday and probably this afternoon uh, there will be a conclusion of this sandpit. That's also very important to have these uh, opportunities where people can uh, uh, discuss about new projects. So giving opportunity to uh, create new projects, giving funding, and highlighting the uh, examples of people that are successful. Uh, this is the three step. I will not say that, that we are uh, the best in doing that, but that's really what we are trying to put in place. Thanks a lot, Jean-Christophe. And I guess, I don't want to presume, but in, in Circle U also, we are trying to do that in a way also. Showcasing, as you said, with the prize, showcasing project with the knowledge of also trying to connect people and trying also to attract some other funding that making it possible. And if I may, before ending, uh, ending here the, the panel and uh, reaching the final uh, step, we have some academic chair from the Climate Hub here. I'm looking at Marnik, etc. So the Knowledge Hub Climate in Circular is one of the, the, the three Knowledge Hub where basically the academic and researcher are meeting together and trying to make also interdisciplinarity exist. And I would like maybe to hear from one of the chair here what have been your experience so far after uh, 14 months of, of CQU and, and the climate hubs? So I'm just turning to Marnik, but uh, it can be other uh, chairs uh, because you're not the only one. But uh, maybe just to finalize that, and Sandy is here also. Sandy, you are also here. So just really a few personal impressions about uh, what have been so far the achievement with the Knowledge Hub. So, so far with the Knowledge Hub, we have, of course, uh, met physically because we started uh, during the COVID crisis and that was not so uh, evident. But so uh, now we are on, uh, let's say, at uh, the good speed to, to set up activities and uh, to just to give you an example about interdisciplinarity. Yesterday we organized uh, with the, uh, uh, the Climate Hub on, on Water what is called a happy hour event, uh, so which is actually a, a small scientific uh, seminar which uh, allows to put together people uh, keynote speakers, so we have our colleagues from the University of Paris who were there, people talking about uh, issues related to water, it was related to uh, climate resilience and uh, how we could we uh, actually adapt our cities in order to make them a little bit more climate resilient. This is a kind of an activity we had the keynote speakers, we have the PhD students which were present in hybrid mode, so that means that we were, some were there physically, the other ones were uh, at commodore level and actually we were able to have a very nice discussion. So, so far, I think uh, this is a, a good example of how we can do interdisciplinary research, of course. Uh, in the meantime, a lot of other activities are uh, being set up, uh, joint uh, courses. Uh, we have already already had a summer class last uh, summer uh, in, in, in Humboldt University. And so I think, uh, well, we are good on track in order to achieve uh, the objectives of the Circle UN. We hope that we can continue. I will give the floor to Sandy. <laughs> and maybe, Sandy, if you face also challenges, because it's really positive also, but maybe it, not everything is perfect neither. So yeah, it could be so good. Um, <laughs> so good morning. I'm the chair of Global Health. So yeah, so facing challenges. So I would say in the global health aspect, the main challenge that we're trying to address already is the fact that actually global health is very wide 
and actually has plenty of different definitions. So when actually uh, I became chair, we could see as well that among the people that actually became the chairs, we all from very different backgrounds, very different disciplines. And uh, so what we decided actually to tackle as a first challenge is actually thinking around uh, teaching. So what actually do we mean by global health teaching and how actually is uh, the courses, the syllabus that we're having across the different universities within Circle U uh, acknowledging actually uh, these global health challenges. So global health will be about aspects related actually to the whole health, you know, this kind of one health concept, but also actually thinking about migrations, how actually this actually changes the way we also teach, you know, for medical students, but also beyond, you know, medical studies, global health is also an important topic. So we participated recently to the World Health Summit. So we tried actually to be present there. And actually, just before the World Health Summit, we organized a workshop where we invited a lot of different you know, stakeholders, academic and non-academic partners, to think together about a statement about how actually we think teaching uh, global health, including global health, as well as research-led global health teaching, is important. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Sandy and Manik, to providing a glimpse about what is happening concretely in the knowledge app also. It's really good also. And with that, I would like to maybe uh, uh, close here the, the panel discussion. Thanks a lot to the three panelists. I know it was rather short, and I hope that you are frustrated in a way, because it means that afterwards you can discuss with the colleagues about all that. But thanks once again, and I think we can upload them. Thank you. So I'm very happy by that because, uh, during the discussion I saw uh, the rector, uh, Vincent Blondel, just arrived. And I'm also very happy because you know that he will be the next uh, circular president from the 1st of January. So it's also very good that uh, Vincent can be, can be joining us today. Um, here to maybe uh, close uh, the ceremony, in fact we will have the formal uh, the formal act of uh, giving the, 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 the prize to the awardees. So I would like to invite to the three awardees here and also invite Vincent as a rector of uh, Université uh, Catholique de Louvain and uh, the next president of Circulu to come on the stage and maybe uh, have a small picture. And I don't know if Vincent, maybe you want to say a few words? <laughs> I'm sorry to, to take you like this. <laughs> so hello to everyone. and. Uh very welcome to those of you who are not from uh, Louvain-la-Neuve or from UC Louvain. I can attest, and you just mentioned we had uh, actually a general assembly in Paris, was it last week? Yes, last week, was last week. And so I can attest how much uh, interdisciplinary but also transdisciplinary work is important and is very, it's really core to, to, to Circle U. And so we, we also know that the, the present model of, of science, both in terms of, uh, say for example, awarding grants or also publishing papers, doesn't push that much in that direction for, for, for the moment. And, and this is more the, the inertia and the tradition because things are now changing, they are moving uh, to interdisciplinary rather than concentrated on a particular disciplines. And so uh, I think that uh, in, many, in many countries, and, and Circle U contributes to that, uh, including transdisciplinary and interdisciplinary into uh, the, the objectives of uh, um, panels for evaluation of projects, or uh, with illustration like the one we have here, success stories, successful stories, about the impact of interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary research is a, is a good illustration. This is the first exercise for Circle U of, of awarding uh, these prizes. So not only congratulations for getting the prize, but you're getting also the first uh, Circle, U, Circle U prize. I think it sends a, a strong signals from on the side of, of Circle U deciding to award these prizes in these interdisciplinary uh, uh, disciplines and so uh, it's really a commitment of all nine universities and you of course know most of them in London with King's and we have awardees from King's from Berlin, in Paris, in Aarhus, in Oslo, in Belgrade, in Pisa and in Vienna <laughs> and, and UC Louvain, we're trying nine nine universities. So we're all very proud of, of, of these prizes, all these nine universities they bring together about half a million students. They bring together more than 300 ERC grantees. And so it's, a, it's really a, a powerhouse in, in, in Europe. And, and sending these signals is certainly very important to all of us, to Circle U, and also to the uh, um, 
General Assembly members, including the nine rectors and vice chancellor and president of these universities. Okay, so it gives me great pleasure awarding the prize. How should we proceed? First part for our colleague from uh, King's College London and the project language of mechanization and Nilo is here representing the project team. So Nilo is the first person here. Then uh, another prize for uh, the team from the University of Oslo and Manon and Inga are there. So the Vikings project. Yeah. Wow, a Vikings project. <laughs> that sounds good. And last but not least, uh, you know that our colleague from uh, Humboldt University to Berlin, Robert, is not here. But uh, Robert, we will send you, of course, uh, this uh, small certificate. Do not worry. But we can applaud again for, for the team of uh, Robert in uh, Humboldt. Thank you. So with that, I think that we can close this uh, award ceremony. Once again, thanks very much to the team here at the University of Louvain for organizing this event. It has been very uh, intense, I guess, for you, but really interesting for us. Uh, as uh, the rector said, um, you know that it's just the first edition of the prize, so there will be a second edition with a ceremony. Uh, the, the award will be in Belgrade at the University of Belgrade, and a third one also the year after will be at King's uh, College London. So if you are a researcher, an academic, and you have uh, some project that you want to, to present and apply for the prize, please go. Um, the call is not uh, open yet. I'm turning to David not to say it's not open. When? Soon. It will be open soon. Um, but please keep an eye on the website of CircleU. And once again, thanks very much. And I think that we can uh, all go to the Thomas More uh, Auditorium, where there will be a small uh, cocktail lunch uh, and that we can continue the discussion. Thanks again, and have a really good afternoon and a safe trip back home. Thank you. Thank you.